friends all over the world. Um, I'm extremely honoured to bring to you today a little discussion with the Grand Traverse Band of Adair and Chippewa Indians. Um, I'm with Tom Showman, and he's one of the councilmen, tribal council here. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about the history of the tribe, and we're going to talk a bit about some of the issues that are affecting them today. Um, so, Tom, can, can you tell us a little bit about how long you've lived in this area and how you became a tribal councilman here? Sure. Uh, I ran for tribal council about six years ago. I was elected uh, for a four-year term. During that term, I was the NREC chair, which is Natural Resource Environmental Committee of the tribe for four years. Mm -hmm. Part of my duties uh, under that committee was I was a representative for CORA, which is the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority, which gets its uh, powers from the tribes coming together and um, the original 1836 tribes. Uh, that was the Treaty of Washington, a uh, treaty that our people signed in 1836. And so, <clears throat> so uh, since then, uh, some of our tribes uh, have been reaffirmed and, and come back and been federally recognized. So at that point, um, gained legal status. So then we came together and we uh, worked together to uh, to take care of our natural resources um, and create regulations um, to uh, for hunting and fishing and gathering in our tr uh, treaty area. Who, who, you mentioned there's a there's a group of tribes that came together and became I think federally recognized. Who 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 are the tribes that are in this area? What are the well, each tribe has its own unique story. Okay, uh, all the uh, there were tribes living in the area. We were all Odawas. There were different bands. Um, we traveled a lot in this area. We were always a hunting and fishing people. Uh, we did have aquaculture. And we were, uh, especially Otto, Odawas were known for trading. Uh, our copper was found all over the North and South America. So um, <clears throat> after the treaty, uh, we went through some history where we had a, another treaty in 1855. Um, some at, at, during the late 1800s, early 1900s, uh, a lot of our people lost their federal record, what, they, what we would refer to as federal recognition. So we were Indians, but we weren't federally recognized Indians. We didn't have a official government to govern us. Um, we were just kind of blended into the society. Uh, we always maintained a, uh, a governmental status and or it kept organized uh, not as structured as we are now, but we kept, you know, we kept our culture alive, um, kept our traditions alive, uh, but uh, the government didn't recognize that authority. So, fast forward in the, uh, I think in the 1950s, Bay Mills was or, uh, better recognized than Sault Ste. Marie in the 60s. We came along later in the uh, in 80s, 90s. The uh, Little Travers and uh, Little River were federally recognized, so it was a process for the for the five Cora tribes. <clears throat> mm -hmm. But now that we're organized, um, you know, each tribe has its own role, laws and rules. You know, a lot of times people think uh, Native American tribes are all one one big tribe or one big uh, entity. It's not true. We each have our own individual legal authority. So our tribe has its own court system, its own legal system. We make as a as a tribal counselor, my jo my job is to make laws, is to uh, um, set uh, approve policies and procedures um, that that run in our tribal government. We're also our board of directors for our. <clears throat> economic development, so for our casinos, hotels, restaurants, the th things of that nature, mm -hmm. we um, were the board of directors. So we kind of wear a couple hats in that way. Um, our tribal council is set up in a way where we have a chairman and six tribal councilors. Um, we, uh, we are 
our combined executive uh, um, legislative branch. So we oversee everything, but we don't get involved in the day-to-day -day stuff. We delegate that authority to the travel manager and our CEO who would take care of day-to-day. -day. Okay, and you mentioned treaty, here, but people that don't understand, can you just give a basic idea of w what a treaty is? Because there's so much talk these days about these treaties and how important they are and how they aren't being recognized, how they're not being followed through on and how they're being broken continually. And, and many people out there may not understand exactly what a treaty is and what power it gives. Can you give a high-level sure, overview sure. of that? <clears throat> so, um, I would say that uh, our, <clears throat> well, treaties are contracts. And, and, you know, basically, we have a contract with the United States government that our ancestors signed and give us certain rights. Um, these, uh, this treaty the original treaty of 1836 predates Michigan. So that was part of their initiative to get Michigan a state, statehood. They needed more land. They wanted to have more people come here. So they wanted control of the Great Lakes. You know, the Great Lakes is one of the great uh, highways of the world. Right, it's 20% so, of the world's fresh drinking right, water right here. Right, and um, commerce at that time was really uh, done through shipping and you know the trains were involved and you know Chicago uh, was a big area of that but really the shipping through the Great Lakes w was paramount to the economy of the United States of America at that time and so it was the gateway to the West you know shipping you bring things in um, from Europe <laughs> and from Asia but <clears throat> Uh, so going back to the treaty, the treaty itself, where there were two treaties that, that our people signed, uh, 1836 and 1855, and again, those are contracts that we signed um, with the United States government that said, we'll do this, you'll do this. We uh, inherently keep our rights to do this and this and this on our land, and those basically uh, are rights to hunting, fishing, gathering, we have uh, what I would ca characterize as, as property rights here. This is where our people are from, you know. Um, when people say, oh, I'm this, I'm that, you know, we're Odawa's Ojibwe people, we're from here. This is our, our homeland, uh, our spirit is here, our ancestor spirits are here, and, and, and that's uh, really what's driven us to maintain our identity here. Right, and without putting you on the spot, this just came to mind. Um, so if I have a contract with you to do X, and the government over here has a contract with you to do Y, if you've given land in the first place, and the government are breaking that side of their treaty, what is it that prevents you saying, this land that we've given you is Michigan, so you can do what you wanted to do? And you're not allowing us to, fight to you're not honoring your side of the bargain. If this was business, my understanding is you, the court would go, well, you didn't do that, so they don't have to do this. Right. Well, <laughs> there's, there's a lot of things going on in, in that realm. To sue the government, you have to get a bill through uh, one, one uh, area of Congress. Uh, there, there's a statutory name for it, and uh, uh, it'll come to me in a few minutes, but. Um, We've attempted to do that. You know, we understand we don't want to take this land back. Right. You know, all the people here are the disruption of lives and, and, and all that stuff. But we would like the United States government to live up to the things that they laid out that they were going to do, uh, that they never did right from the first day. Um, and, and we have a well-documented history of how those things happened. And there, and there was a variety of, of things that happened um, but um, we really believe that uh, if people were to read that history, that they would have a better understanding, excuse me, of why we feel so strongly um, about our rights here. Um, and also, <clears throat> you know, the, the, you have the legal side of it. But really, um, you have the spiritual side of it. And the spiritual side of it is much more important. 
because I'm, you know, if I live to be a hundred, then I'll, I'll be an old man. And a hundred years is, you know, maybe a long time. But um, my family's been here for thousands of years. And, you know, when you uh, <clears throat> look at the spiritual side, you know, we believe we're tied to this land right here. So it's our duty and responsibility and, and to help take care of this land. And, and you know, uh, part of our treaty rights are treaty responsibilities. And part of that responsibility is to fight things like Line 5, fight things like Nestle trying to take all the water out of, out of the Great Lakes area um, for profit. And I think when you look at those things, um, that's why there's a calling inside of us to do these things. And, I, and I'm very proud to say that, you know, our tribe is really working hard. We've designated, you know, Desmond Berry to really lead the charge on this. Um, he's an excellent spokesman, and he does a really good job of researching things and, and bringing them to the forefront, bringing people together. So we hope to build a real coalition to show people why this is so important and to prevent a catastrophe of really biblical proportions. When you look at uh, what this would do with uh, a couple million gallons of oil, you know, really millions and millions of gallons of oil right. uh, spread out through the Great Lakes. I, I think, you know, you, <laughs> I, I can't emphasize that enough. To, in my mind, you know, that's a catastrophe of biblical proportion, that 20, over 20% 20 of the world's water, fresh water, would be contaminated in that sense. Um, the ecosystem would be damaged for hundreds of years. All that, all, the, all those things are facts. It's just a matter of getting people to realize it and really getting them calling. I, I think we're looking at bringing these, this information forward, building a coalition, because it's not just for us. You know, it's for everybody in the Great Lakes region and really in the nation, you know. That, that this affects. And <clears throat> when you look at the economics of it towards the United States, just because there's a pipeline there and some people are making money off of that pipeline is minuscule to, compared to the millions of people that rely on the Great Lakes for fishing, for uh, their economic base, the beaches, the hotels, the restaurants, you know, the, it, there's a whole economy built on that. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I heard figures while I've been here this week of that economy brings in to Michigan $38 billion, billion right. dollars, and the pipeline brings in somewhere in the realm of less than $30 million right. to Michigan. And that's just Michigan. We haven't talked about Canada. We haven't talked about Illinois. We haven't talked about Wisconsin. We haven't talked, you know, so uh, it's far-ranging effects. And, um, but go, going back a little bit to um, what we do here as a tribe, uh, I, I think, you know, really it's important for us to uh, be inclusive and lead the charge on, on getting this thing removed. Uh, again, you know, we, we, we've said it over and over and over again, it's a 64-year pipeline. Um, with a 50-year life expectancy, um, you know, those numbers just don't add up. You know, one, it's so funny, I, I think we're such a visual people. When you look at uh, the structure, um, uh, when you look at the pictures of when they were installing the pipeline, you know, uh, in the late 40s, early 50s, and you see, you know, uh, Model T's in the parking lot, and old steam shovels, you know, working uh, these old cranes, then you realize, wow, that technology is really old. Wow, that pipeline is really old. And yeah, it's held up well. And they th used to build things strong with strong metals and all that kind of stuff back then, but the technology wasn't the same. It, it isn't, it, they aren't uh, cased inside of a, a, a pipeline inside of a pipeline. Mm -hmm. no, we don't, that's not the case. 
if it if when it breaks, that's it. It's broke, and the, and and the oil's going to come flowing out at, at, at a tremendous rate. Um, <clears throat> and 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 you won't. We won't know right away. <laughs> you know, especially right now. If it happened right now as we were speaking, right. the, state of the Great Lakes. We flew over the Great Lakes the other day, and it's solid ice. So how would you? Right. And if you did, what could you do? to remedy it right then. Right. So, when you look at all those factors, you know, that's why we're really, um, I'm really proud to say that we're going to take a leadership role and bring this thing forward. Uh, <clears throat> I, I want to get back to, to talk about the Chippewa Ottawa Resource Authority, CORA. Uh, I think all the tribes are on board. You know, I, I know all the tribes are on board. You know, we've passed resolutions uh, as an intertribal agency to, to um, have the pipeline removed. Um, Cora, uh, we really we look at all of our hunting and fishing regulations and because we don't want to overfish. We don't want to overhunt. We want to keep in balance with nature. Um, so each, each tribe, we look at these things, we bring them forward, we talk to them. Yeah, we have disagreements, but we work together to, for the betterment of, of Mother Nature. No, absolutely. And actually, I know you, you've pretty heavily stated your position, but you, you as a tribal council have gone further than that. You have a resolution that you've written, which yes. is which is which is categorical. Um, can you just describe the re resolution that, that, that's been written? Well, the resolution was uh, to have the pipeline removed. There's no good reason to have it there. There's no good reason. There's absolutely no good reason other than, well, and it's not a good reason, but it's greed, in my opinion. You, you have a, a pipeline company that's making money every day that that pipeline's in there, um, and to shut the valve off, they'll be losing a little bit of money. That's the, you know, and to think that um, what they're risking for their own personal greed is really, it's mind-boggling to me. I don't know how people can, can live with themselves. And uh, <clears throat> so our tribal nation um, has, has taken that stance. And not, not just uh, legally, you know, we're looking at other legal avenues and uh, options that we have. Um, we're trying to get people together uh, uh, politically and we, and we really want to point out the economics of it and and have become an awareness so I uh, I know the families that live all along the shore or well, that live in this whole region you know care deeply that's why people move here you know I I, I recently spoke with our uh, our uh, local state representative, you know, uh, about it. We were talking about another uh, project that's be, that's working on, but um, for it's a veterans uh, program, but, you know, I, I couldn't leave the meeting without saying, you know, because everybody referenced all oh, the economic base and everything that's going in Traverse City and and well, how great it is here with the bays and the water. And I said, but, you know, when Line of Five breaks, all that's gone. People aren't going to want to live here anymore. This is all gone. All your land, all your property owners in this area, your land will devalue overnight. Overnight. And, and you know, that starts getting people thinking, okay, yeah, this affects all of us. And so uh, <clears throat> there's reason, you know, not just uh, for the spiritual reasons that we're doing it for, but where there's economic reasons, there's spiritual reasons, there's uh, <coughs> logical reasons, you know, there, there's all these kinds of reasons on why to just turn it off. Just, and then have it removed, and then it's done, it's over. They have enough capacity to not use it. There, right. There's no reason, it's just plain stubbornness and greed. There's no other reason. And I, I, I can't say anything more categorically than that. Absolutely, and you, you echo the words of flow for love of water. We sat down with them the other day and did an interview, and uh, they, he drew 
the founder of Flow, drew a map of the different pipelines and showed the maps and showed the original capacity of these lines and showed the increased capacity and showed how much came through through line five. And the maths clearly show there's absolutely no need for line five. Right. Just as you said. So the story isn't being told here. Enbridge, right. Enbridge are not telling the story. Enbridge are coming out. We went to the safety advisory board meeting and we were baffled by non-science. It was They spoke about the, the coating that's coming off the pipe, but somehow it's not a problem. But they, there's the muscles down there, the quagga muscles, that are on the pipeline. There's the increased currents in the straits. Because I wanted to ask you, the Lake Michigan, you look at it as a living, breathing right. person, right? Yeah, yeah. It has a spirit. The water has a spirit. And, you know, um, it's been damaged, you know, with... With the invasives that have come come in, it's changed her biology. You know, she's had to adjust. You know, and, and so, you know, this would be, you know, this would be almost a death blow. You know, to, for for that pipeline to break. And you know, in the 1950s, there were no zebra mussels and quagga mussels. You know, attacking the the pipeline. Um, they underestimated the currents. They, you know, th this was 1950. They didn't understand everything they do now. You know, it, it's only a matter of time. I think uh, <clears throat> you just can't say it enough. It's in everybody's best interest in the United States of America. Even the people that are making money off of the pipeline, it's in their best interest to shut this thing off. You know, long term. Short term, yep, they'll lose some profits. Some of their profitability will go down. Um, it, it, it makes me wonder, you know, I haven't done the, the, the depth of the research, but it makes me wonder who owns this pipeline. What's their real, it makes you wonder sometimes, do they have a, a different motivation? You know, maybe foreign entities are, you know, uh, uh, want that. Yeah, you know, I'm not saying that, but I'm saying I haven't done enough research. Right. To, I've heard to, various, various things right. myself, and at this point, I'm not going to say anything, but we're looking at some things that right. are quite interesting, but, but I, and I, I want to talk hear. facts. Right. But yeah, the, you're right. There's, there's a, the, the feels to all the people that care deeply that when a seven-year-old child can look at this and say, this makes no sense. I've asked them, we asked them the other night, right. what would you do? Well, it wouldn't be there. Why not? Because we all need to drink water. It's that simple. There's something else going on behind this that it isn't just being stopped right now. Why they would take the risk to let this happen and then go, oh my gosh, what happened? We can't believe it. No, everyone's told you it's going to happen. So there's something right. something strange going on there, indeed. So. I, and you guys don't just talk the talk. You walk the walk. I mean, as you said, you put Desmond in charge of, in charge of bringing awareness, in charge of the research. But even right here on your own reservation, you've got green energy. You have yes. a... So tell us a little bit about that. Um, well, it, it's, it's a start. You know, we are utilizing solar. Um, we, when we built our casino, it was, uh, it wasn't, uh, was it LEED certified, but it was right there. There was a couple things that we, we couldn't do, but we really worked hard to um, make it as energy efficient as possible. I was, former facility, I was a facilities manager for the tribe for 24 years. Um, and we always worked that way. We always worked to have the newest lighting, to have it to, to minimize the impact, just as one, for instance, to minimize the impact uh, on uh, Mother Nature, having, you know, uh, <clears throat> energy efficient buildings and, and those type of things. So uh, as our economic base has grown, We've really worked hard to keep those things in mind and uh, walk that walk, as you said. Um, <clears throat> for a long time, our people were very poor here. When, when I was a little boy, you know, when you talked about the history, uh, I used to come up in Pow Wow for Shabby Town, and uh, there was uh, two wells in town, one well on the north side, one well on the south side. And most people carried their water, to, you know, in through in throughout the village. Um, that wasn't all that long ago. I mean, right? I'm not that old. No, no, exactly. Right. <laughs> yeah, okay. But no, so, that really wasn't that. that I mean, right. We're, we're talking, talking about we're talking about the 70s, 60s, and 70s. 60s and 70s. Right. Um, 
<clears throat> and so, you know, just to have a little perspective, you know, uh, we're, we're not uh, this uh, huge, you know, economic, we've become an economic power in, in the region, but we certainly have our, our challenges and, and um, but we're devoting real resources to this because it's that important. Absolutely, and uh, I mean, I thank I thank you for taking this stance and doing this and, and leading the way. And I guess one final question is: you have, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, you have equal authority when it comes to doing things to protect the Great Lakes with the state. It's between you and the state to make sure that things go okay, to make sure things are protected. And we noticed when we had the Pipeline Safety Advisory Board, you had representation of one person on a board of, I think it was 16 people. So in my mind, it seems like you should have eight people on that board, just logic. Again, if you ask a kid at school, if there's two people that are in charge of this thing, and you have 16 people on a board, how many from each side would there be? Well, and, and, and to that point, okay, there's 13 uh, federally recognized tribes in Michigan. Mm -hmm. Each tribe should have a representative on that board because we're each distinct individual entities. And the state should have one person on that board because we're e we are equal to the state. So in, in that aspect, you know, it's not the state and the Indians. It's the Grand Traverse Band of Ottawa and Chippewa Indians. It's the Little Traverse Bay Band of Odawa Indians. It's the Huron and Ottawasepi. It's, you know, all the different tribes that need to be represented individually because we each have unique uh, perspectives uh, just like the state just like uh, the state should be the uh, state of Michigan the state of Illinois the state of Wisconsin there's no difference and so I think sometimes we lose sight of that and, and people don't uh, equate that just because the state is big and the state has more resources and more people uh, but uh, when you look at the authority that's granted. It's it, it is equal. So um, that needs to be in mind because we've been here longer than the state. And uh, when you look at the um, Constitution of the United States, you know, when you look at the articles, the articles of Declaration, you know, it mentions that you know the the United States government will do treaties with tribes and. and um, you know, and, and that's before any of the, 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 the Bill of Rights and all that stuff. You know, they, they recognized we're, we're going, you know, this is, these are unique nations. And we have to, you know, have to deal with that. And, and so that relationship uh, is the same. So I, I can't stress that enough. I, I, I think I would recommend uh, for anyone, there's uh, one of our tribal members, Matthew Fletcher wrote a book, The Eagle Has Returned, um, gives a really strong legal account of the tribe um, from a legal perspective. So I would really recommend uh, anybody who really wants to learn more to read that. Um, and you, you, you'll really get a, a good perspective on who we are and why we're here legally. I would love to see. I would love to see that. But actually, I'd love to sit down with Matthew Des um, if we had the opportunity. Um, <laughs> and so this journey continues. So one I final call him. <laughs> brilliant. One final question, um, or point maybe. Uh, so this pipeline was put in before you were federally recognised. Yes. So now you are federally recognised, and you clearly have a say in what happens. Have you ever been asked to? Your thoughts about having this pipeline there, in that no. sense? You've never been consulted on that no, pipeline? No, we've never had formal consultation. Um, we, we, we hope to. Um, I, I think uh, that's something that we're looking at and how, how we're going to effectively do that. You know, um, we invite that, we want that. Um, I, I, you know, one of the things um, the federal government has a trust responsibility for Native tribes. And I, I think uh, both the BIA and Fish and Wildlife 
Army Corps engineers, there's so many different, EPA, there's so many different agencies that really need to look at this and, and their trust responsibility on how it affects us. And um, that, uh, that's something that we're looking very deeply I think um, you know the fact that you're sitting here shows what a worldwide issue this is. You know, I really want to thank you. You know, I, it means a lot to me personally that you're here, and and I I, I really mean that. You know, I, I really think that people like you are uh, help us and and and. Help us get this message out, and um, it's it's so good to know that our spirits are aligned like that, and that you know uh, I, I've watched many of your videos, and I really I can't say it enough that how much my heart is filled with love because that you the things that you're bringing the, these things forward, and I've seen you across you know on, on different things you know uh, um, when. <clears throat> Our tribe sent a delegation out to Little, uh, out to Standing Rock, and and you know uh, the pride, you know, dancing our flag in, and and you know we had a lot of members, uh, our citizens that went out there and stood with their nation. Um, you know we tried to be very respectful when we did that. We went out there and we met with their tribal council and gifted them and let them know that we were there to stay, stand by them. That's their territory. We're not going to get in, you know, if they call for our help, we're going to be there to help, but uh, we're going to have to tell them how to do their business. But, you know, um, it was an honor to go there and be part of that, you know, and to see people like yourself there and, and the things that you you uh, bring forth across, you know, the world. I, I think it's just wonderful. So I wanted to say that, you know, while I'm saying well, thank you. Uh, you know, I never knew this was going to be my journey that happened from the night of November 20th. Um, and we've just continued forward with it and we are building from this point. We're, we're setting up a non-profit and I'm really excited because people from your uh, tribal citizens have asked to step up and be on the board. So we're going to announce that soon and we're going to have that in place. And I thank you for being here today and I, being on the weekend. I also thank you for joining us tonight. And for everyone who's watching right now, who's enjoyed what's been said, we're going to continue this tonight at 7 p.m. Eastern, except what we're going to do is we're going to have a different group of tribal citizens who are going to be talking and explaining what it's like to grow up in two worlds. The spiritual world that they've always been in, and then being assimilated into this Western world and this school system and this job system, and how, and how that affected them and what their experiences were. And maybe try and break down some of those walls that are out there right now, because there's a misperception from the people that grew up in the Western world of when someone who's native does this, what it means. We think it means that, but really what it means is something totally different. So our tribal councilman's going to be joining us for that discussion as well. So thank you everyone. Come and join us tonight. We'll put a link out for the event. It's going to be live again in the same place and you can invite your friends and family. And I suggest you do because this is the kind of stuff that needs to be taught in schools. Schools is about ticking boxes and turning pages. It doesn't teach any real history. In fact, it teaches worse than real history. It teaches a biased, untrue story of history which continues the hatred and the misunderstanding and the division that this country, unfortunately, has been built on for a long time. And we want to try and break those walls down together. Looking forward to it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.